Revelation for some time now, and we're in Revelation chapter 21, and we intend to continue that next week. This morning, this morning, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn to two places, if you will, Job 25, thank you, brother, Job 25 and Romans chapter 3, Job 25 and Romans chapter 3. I had on Sunday night, last Sunday night, as we have been for the last several years before our Bible conference, we have a, a cowbell service, and I think we had nine preachers this year, and that cowbell service, and we preach along the lines of at least the topic for our theme for our Bible conference, and they're just short, short messages. I think we had seven minutes this week, or this, this year during the Bible conference. But uh, I was working on something for that little short seven-minute sermon and wound up with about four pages of notes. <clears throat> and so I, I realized really quickly that I couldn't preach that in seven minutes. And so um, I just shared something else in that little short sermon that I had noticed when reading those first five chapters of Romans repeatedly. And that was how that Paul had such great concern for the people at Rome, having never met them and never having been privileged to be around them, yet he prayed for them and had great concern for them. And, uh, you know, there's people like that. We have concern for people like that as well. We pray for missionaries. We pray for their work. We pray for their feel. Oftentimes, we don't even know those missionaries, and we certainly don't know the folks that they're working with. But we have a great desire to see those folks saved and grow in the Lord. And uh, Paul seemingly had the same concern there for the Romans. But anyway... I had prepared a message on justification, and uh, certainly we heard great preaching about that during the Bible conference, that's for sure, but I want to look at that again today, and I do hope the Lord will help us. I was thinking just a moment ago, sitting there, we was in Sunday school this morning, and in our Sunday school class, we were talking about the abomination of desolation, and talking about Daniel's 70th week, and all that stuff, and, and then maybe this may seem like a very simple message this morning, and it is, but it's also a very important message. And I remember one of the preachers, I, I don't remember which preacher it was, and that's one of the great things about Bible conference. We had great preachers here, probably some of the greatest in the world. And, but at the end, when it's all over, you don't really remember what preacher said what, and that's because each preacher had something to say about the Bible or something to say about the Lord. And that's what we remember. But I remember one of those preachers talking about how important it is that we get back to preaching the gospel. And uh, I, I, I believe that. I, I certainly know that we don't preach salvation every service. We need to learn the Bible. And uh, we try to do that around here. We try to learn the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We want to do that. But I, I think there's often times, many times, that maybe we should just get back to the basics once in a while and tell people how important it is to be saved. And people that lost need to be saved, and people that are saved need to be reminded that they're not worthy, uh, that they haven't done anything to earn it or deserve it. God's been good to them and given it to them. And so we can rejoice in that. In fact, I think the, 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 not the Bible say that the, um, the preaching of the gospel, I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember the verse verbatim, is to them that are the power of God to them that are saved. And so uh, what a blessing it is. So I want to read this one verse here in Job chapter 23, or Job chapter 25. Now I'm not interested in context or anything as far as this verse is concerned. I will when I get to Romans. But there's a great question asked here in Job 25 and verse number 3. And this is the question. How then can man be justified with God? How then can man be justified with God, or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Well, those, those are two great questions. How, how can a man be justified with God, and how can a man that is born with woman be clean? Here's an individual long before, long before Calvary, long before Christ dying on the cross, that realized man was not good enough to get himself to God. He was going to have to be justified. He was going to have to be clean. And he didn't know how to answer that question. He had the question, but he didn't have the answer to that question. I'm glad you and I today are privy to the answer to that question. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The questions are often asked. Many times the questions are asked, how can a man, 
have the best of this world or how can a man be healthy? How can a man be happy? How can a man be prosperous? How can a man find favor with his mankind? And you could just go on and on and on. That list could just go on and on and on. But when a man discovers himself guilty before God and understands his guilt before God, his question will be, how can a man be justified with God? And so I, uh, now listen, so with the help of the Lord, I want to answer that question by answering other questions from the Bible that I'm going to ask. Now, I understand that uh, the political world in the day that we live in is a mess. And I understand that politicians answer questions with questions. And they answer those questions with questions because they do not want to answer the question. But I want to answer this question, how can a man be justified with God? I want to answer that question. I don't want to, I don't want to be dodging around it answering questions. I want to ask and answer questions that prove the answer to this question that we can, in fact, be just with God. I'm glad that we can, aren't you? So let's look at several things today with the help of the Lord. And we'll begin in Romans chapter 3. We'll pray together and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I, I need your help today. I have had several opportunities to go uh, through this outline. And each time we've made changes and other things that we felt needed. And Lord, it doesn't matter how much time that I've spent in preparation doesn't matter, not that that doesn't matter, I don't mean that, Lord, but apart from you helping us today, it'll be, um, it'll be worthless indeed. I certainly need your help. I pray that you will speak through us. I pray that you will use us, Lord, to rightly divide the word of truth and to speak that truth in such a way that it'll be helpful, Lord, to your people. I, I have no idea that anyone's here today that's lost. But Lord, there may be someone listening. There may be someone listening later. Uh, via our uh, social media outlets that, that provide this message, whatever the case may be, I pray that you would help us today and that you would use us today uh, to rightly divide your word, Lord, and preach that word in truth and in power. And to do that, Lord, I certainly need your help. We ask that help in Jesus' name. Amen. So how can a man be justified, or how then can a man be justified with God? First of all, the question that I will ask is, do all men need to be justified? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. Now, I'm not just answering that question yes. I am answering that question yes because that is the right answer. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want to give you Bible proof why it is necessary for all men to be justified. First of all, look at Romans 3. In Romans 3, look at verse number 9. The first reason is because all are under sin. The Bible says in verse number 9 of Romans 3, What then are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved, both Jew and Gentile, that they are all under sin. So all men need to be justified because all are under sin. Look at verse number 19, same chapter. Not only are all under sin, all are guilty before God. Verse number 19 says, Now we know that what things whoever the law saith, it said to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So we see two reasons so far. The need of men being justified, all have sinned. All the world is guilty before God. Verse number 23 of this same Romans chapter 3 says, All have come short. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in verse number 23. So what we see here in this passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 3, that both Jew and Gentile under the law are guilty before God. And if we read, we were to read a majority of these verses, and we're not going to take the time to do that, but if we were to read verses 10 through 18, we would come to the conclusion that the Bible says every mouth is stopped, every conscience is smitten, and every soul is guilty before God. 
So all men must be justified for all are condemned. Verse 22 of that same chapter says, For there is no difference. We are all guilty before God. Now, so the question is asked, do all men need to be justified? Yes. So then we would, we would, we would want to know, or we would think we would want to know, what is it then to be justified? Now, justification, this was touched on greatly during our conference But justification is legally declaring a man righteous when practically he is not. In other words, legally in the eyes of God, when you and I are saved, when we are born again, we are declared just. We're declared righteous in the sight of God when obviously in our practically, practically in our daily living, it is very obvious that none of us are very just. I'm glad that I have been accredited to my account, the righteousness of God. So what is justification? It is legally declaring a man righteous when practically he is not. Now, in these chapters here, in the book of Romans, in these three chapters, and mainly in chapter 5, we'll look at in just a moment, we'll notice a sevenfold blessing placed upon those who are justified. Let's look at this. To be justified is to be forgiven. Look at chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, look at verse number 7. To be justified is to be forgiven. Romans chapter 4, verse number 7 says this, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord will not impute sin. So three things here in this passage of Scripture alone, we see that our iniquities are forgiven, we see that our sins are covered, and we see that the Lord will not impute unto us sin. That is a great blessing of being justified. Now, second of all, second of all, to be justified is to be reckoned righteous. Look at verse number 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision, speaking of the Jew, of course, or, the, or upon the uncircumcision also, speaking of the Gentile. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Now, the word reckoned here means counted or imputed. So Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith in God. What a great blessing. Now, to be justified is to be forgiven. To be justified is to be reckoned righteous. To be justified is to have peace with God. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible says, therefore being justified by faith, so it's, it's not by works, it's not by deeds, it's not by religion, it's not by church membership, it's not by water baptism. The Bible says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if there's one person in all this world that you want to have peace with, it's God. I want to be at peace with you. I want to be at peace with my wife. I want to be at peace with my neighbors. But I promise you, far more important than all of that is I want to have peace with God. And the only way that we can have peace with God is to be justified. Now, this week, I was, I think it was uh, one morning this week in the motel room, I was looking at these, and this word, I've actually looked at this word in the past, but I haven't thought much about it recently. But there's a word there, that second word in Romans chapter 5, that word being is repeated several times in chapter number 5. And it says, therefore, being justified. Now, being, the word being, it means existing in a certain state. It means the, a, a one-time event in which we continue to exist. So we were justified one time and we continue to exist in that justification. I'll give you a great example of that. We are a human being. I will never be anything other than a human being. You may identify as a dog. You are a human You may self-identify as a horse, but you are a human being. It doesn't matter what you self-identify as, you are a human being. You were born that way, and that is what you are. Being justified by faith, I continue to exist being justified by faith. What a great blessing that is. Now, so it is, we have peace 
with God. So we have to be justified. What is it to be justified? It is to be forgiven. It is to be reckoned righteous. righteous. It is to have peace with God. It is to rejoice in hope. To be justified is to rejoice in hope. Look at the very next verse, Romans 5, 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, this has been mentioned many times. I want to mention it again. In the Bible, the word hope is not maybe it will or maybe it won't. Like getting a gift on your birthday or something. Maybe you will get it. Maybe you won't get it. But hope in the Bible is something in which we have our confidence in. We have full assurance of, we are completely confident that this is what is going to take place. And and specifically, our hope as a believer, our confidence is in, uh, in, in Jesus Christ, and in particular, our hope is in His return for us. In fact, the Bible says in Titus 2 and verse number 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we have hope, our blessed hope, in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I ought to be rejoicing in that hope because we have been justified. Now more than ever, you and I ought to be rejoicing in that hope. Listen, and here's the thing about it. I've made mention of this before. A lot of this is things I've just made mention of over and over and over again, but we need to be reminded again on this first Sunday of the year that there's some things that just need to be rehashed over and over and over again. We ought to be rejoicing in the hope that it's not always going to be like this. We're not always going to be in this situation. One of these days, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming back for you and I. I rejoice in that great hope. You know, the Bible says, the Bible says, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 19, he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, you're of all men most miserable. So listen, if here and now is the only time that you have hope in Christ, you are a miserable individual. Now let me put it this way. If 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 the only hope that you have is that God will heal you, if the only hope that you have is if God will pay your bills, if the only hope that you have is if God will provide for your needs, then you are all men most miserable because we have hope in God way past this world, amen, that is in the return of our Lord Jesus Christ for you. Now, here's the reason. Jesus is our hope, and because Jesus is our hope, we Christians can rejoice. And so we are, we to be justified is to rejoice in hope. In fact, I believe one of the one evidences of a, uh, an individual, a believer, having a desire to sing songs and hymns that exalt the Savior and magnify the Lord is some sort of some kind of proof of the fact that he is rejoicing in the hope of his salvation. And so we are to rejoice in hope. Now, here's the fifth thing. To be justified is to possess the love of God. Look at verse number 5. And hope maketh not a shame, look at this, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now, the word shed means to pour out or to allow it to flow out. I'll give, I'll give you a couple of examples. You, to shed, you shed tears. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed. It poured out. The sun sheds its light upon this earth. And so the Bible tells us here in this verse of scripture, it says, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And so you and I, we have been justified by, because of our justifying, the result of our justification is that we possess the love of God. We, and, and that love is shed abroad in our hearts. We have, we have a love for things that we used to hate. We have a love for things that we one time wanted no part of. We have a love for people that we one time had no desire to speak to or to be around or to have any kind of fellowship with. How did all those things happen? God shed that love abroad in our heart. There was a young man here this week. Uh, his name was Kyle from Pennsylvania. He was here in our Bible conference this week. And um, 
My wife was telling me that one day she was talking to him down in the fellowship hall. The first time this young man had ever been to our church. He's 18, 19 years old or something. He said, you know, he says, it's a strange thing. It seems like I have known you guys forever, and I've only been here a couple of days. You know, you know what that is? It is the love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You, you, don't, you don't have to have a long-term friendship to get to know somebody because God has spread His love abroad in your heart. By the way, now that I've mentioned that, I had it written on my paper and hadn't gotten around to it. I want to thank you, church, from the bottom of my heart for being such a kind and caring and loving church. There's, there's several things as a pastor that you absolutely love to hear, and that is when people who attend these meetings from all over the country, we had folks here from, from Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Florida, Tennessee, and all the places in between, and then they all had one common thing. I just can't believe how friendly and how helpful these folks are at your church. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a great blessing. For this, this young man to say, it feels like I have known you guys forever. You know, the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart. Now, you're here this morning, and that kind of love has grown cold. And what does the Bible say in the book of Revelation? They have left their first love. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of God's people. There's a lot of Christian people. who Listen, they haven't lost it, amen, but they have left it. They've gotten cold. They've gotten indifferent. They've gotten to the place in their life where they're filled with apathy. And the things of this world and the cares of this world have overwhelmed them. And the love for God and the love for people seems to have dried up and gone away. But I'm glad that God will shed abroad His love in our hearts. What a blessing. Now, Number six, number six, I've got to move. We've got to move quickly. To be justified is to be saved from wrath. Look at verse number nine. Look at verse number nine, and our word shows up again as well. Much more than, here's our word, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Much more. This verse, this, these, these phrases, now we, I've talked about these much more many times. They're, this phrase appears nine times in the book of Romans, five times alone in chapter number five. This is the first of those, and it comes right after a verse that we, we absolutely adore, and that is Romans 5, 8, where, by, where the Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then. I, what, what in the world could possibly be much more than Christ commending His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died from us? Much more than being justified by His faith. We, by, by, look, look what it says. Be, be, being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. It's not just that He proved His love for us in dying for us. What a, what, a, what a great thing that God would prove His love by dying for us. But if Christ had just died in our place, it wouldn't have done us a lot of good if that blood He had shed would not have been capable of justifying us. He died for us. And the blood that he shed has all the ability and all the power to justify us in his sight. And so much more being justified, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, this word being, remember, it means con continuing to exist. Now, all of these people, all these people that think they're going to lose their salvation... All these people that have this idea or this mentality that they have got to help God out in order to stay saved, they have, they have a complete disregard for Scripture or a complete misunderstanding of what the Bible has to say. We are, this, this word being, I'll give you this definition again. If I can find it, it means existing in a certain state. It is a one-time event in which we continue to exist much more than being now justified by his blood. You know, you know what that means? That means I am going to continue in a state 
of justification by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm justified. I was justified the day that I got saved. I was justified the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that, and years and years after that, and I'm still justified today, and tomorrow I'm going to be justified. And you say, yeah, but preacher, what about? But you could what about anything. I have been now justified by His blood, and I'm going to continue to exist in that state of being now justified. Not only that, but I'm going to be saved from the wrath to come. Amen. I, 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 I'm not one bit worried about going to hell. I have, not had, I have not had one bad dream about dying lost and going to hell. I've not had one heartburn about losing my salvation and going to hell. I've not had, I, I've not had one, not one, not one moment have I lost sleep over the fact that I might wind up in hell. You know why? Because I have been saved from wrath through him. What a blessing. I, I hope you've been saved from wrath through him. Amen. Now, there's, there's the last one. There's probably many more. There's another one. To be justified is to be reconciled to God. Look at verse number 10, the very next verse. For if, when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Here's our phrase again. Much more being reconciled. We shall be saved by His life. Now, to be justified is to be reconciled to God. If you're not saved today, you're an enemy of God. You know, I'm not an, yes, you are. If you're not saved, you're an enemy of God. But God has made a way for us to be reconciled to God. To be reconciled, there's two parties at war who have been reconciled, they've been brought together. That has been made possible through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer enemies with God. We have been justified. We are now at peace with God. We have been reconciled. Now, this phrase, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. If you're reconciled, you can never be unreconciled. You are being reconciled. You're going to continue to exist in that state of reconciliation. Now, how is that possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. I won't tell you how it's possible. The Bible told us how it's possible. It's because we're justified by His life, not by my life. You see, my life ain't worth much. My life might be good today. It might not be so good tomorrow. It, it might have been good yesterday. I'm not so sure about the day before that. You following along now? Some of you holier than thou. All of your days are up to par. I've got a, I've got some other Bible scripture I'd like to show you. <laughs> some of it's found in Romans. <laughs> you figure that out in a minute. But uh, we're justified by His life. What a, what a great blessing it is to know that we're saved by His life. We're unable to live our life without sin, so we have received His sinless life. To our account. What a great blessing. Now, if you'll notice, <clears throat> in view of these wonderful blessings that we just made mention of here in these verses of Scripture to those who are justified, what is it not to be justified? Well, the difference is, is, is as much as light and day. The difference is as much as life and death. The difference is as much as heaven and hell. That's how much difference there are. And being justified and not being justified. So first of all, do all men need justification? Yes. What is it to be justified? Who is it that God justified? It's point number three. There's seven of them in case you're counting. And uh, most of them won't take as long as that one. Who is it that God justified? Well, man's wisdom or religious people would probably say that I, I believe God justifies the good or I believe that God justifies the godly. Or they will say, I believe God justifies those who keep the law or those who are religious. But what does the Scripture say? What does the Bible say who God justifies? Well, look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We'll find out in verse number 5 of Romans chapter 4, that that's quite contrary to what the Bible says because the Bible says that he justifies the ungodly. Romans chapter 4, verse number 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. 
His faith is counted for righteousness. So listen, you'll, you will never be justified with God until you realize that you're ungodly. Now, I'm going to look at several things here in just a moment. I'm going to look at, he, he justifies the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. He came to save sinners. You know, all these verses, I'm going to look at all these in just a moment. That, that's, this is one of the problems I have with this. this uh, now, I believe getting saved is easy. I, I, don't, I, I believe salvation requires you putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's some things that you got to know before you can do that. And I, I, I talked to this guy the other day. Here I go getting critical. When I go to getting critical, I get in trouble with people. I talked to this guy the other day, this missionary the other day. Good guy. I like the guy. I like the guy really well. And he said that they had this meeting in India, and they had all of these, all of these Hindus to come to this meeting, a hundred and, and some children come to this special meeting that they have for these, these Hindus. It's the first time that they had ever ever come. This is the first time they'd ever been able to get them to come. That, that's a great thing, man. I, I get them to come, preach the gospel to them. But then his next statement really, really hurt me. He said 74 of them got saved. I hope that's true. And you hope that's true. But all of us that know much of anything at all about the Bible know that that's not true. Because there's several things you have to understand before you can get saved. First of all, you got to understand you're ungodly. And most people don't like coming to that knowledge. And you got to understand that you're a sinner. And you got to understand that you're unjust before God. you got to understand all of those things before you will even have any desire to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, who is godly, who is righteous, who is without sin. I tell you what these Hindus did. They took this God home and set him on the shelf with the other hundred gods that they had. That's not salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so until you... Now, I, I, this is what I'm... I believe salvation is simple. I believe salvation is, is easy. I... I, the, one of the preachers mentioned it this week. I know men in our church who've made this same statement. Brother Johnny, um, Johnny Vernon, he's not been able to be here because of the COVID thing, him and his wife. I've heard him testify on many times, many times. Preacher, I know God saved me the moment that I stood up to even come to that altar. You know why? I don't have anything to do with coming to an altar. It has everything to do with placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I know I was saved at the moment I had decided that I was going to accept Jesus. He saved me right there, preacher, before I ever got up here. That's how easy salvation is. I know that. But there's some things you've got to understand before you come to that realization. And one of those is that you're ungodly. Now, he died for the ungodly. He justified the ungodly. Look at verse number 6, Romans chapter 5. Look at verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And you say, preacher, why is that so important? I, I tell you why I believe it's so important. I don't think you will ever realize that Christ died for you until you realize you're ungodly. Then, then the Bible says in verse number five, verse number eight, we've already, we've already quoted it. He came to save sinners, the Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I realize that I'm repeating myself, but I'm repeating myself because the scripture is repeating itself. And if you never realize, if you never realize and accept the fact that you are an ungodly sinner, you'll never be saved. In fact, Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 5 and verse number 23 or 32, Luke 5, 32, he said, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And so he cannot, he cannot call the righteous, therefore God could not justify them whom Christ had not called. He came to call the sinner to repentance. That's why I think it was Brother Travis that made mention of preaching the law was so important. A man has got to be convicted before God and found guilty before God before he can realize his necessity of being saved by the grace of God. So a man must take his place in the ranks of the ungodly before he can be justified in the sight of God. Listen, it's a very humbling thing to be bowed down, to be broken down over our sin, and not, not over our sin because we got caught, 
but because we have sinned against God before we can be saved. So, do all men need to be justified? Yes. What is it to be justified? Who is it that God justifies? He justifies the ungodly. How can God justify the guilty? Well, he can justify the guilty because he was raised again for our justification. Look at verse 25, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Because his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is righteous. He gives his righteousness to those who he justifies. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 25. Look at verse number 25. Whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And so it's because of his righteousness that we're justified. God can justify the guilty because the atonement he made for our sin Remember the sermon from last Sunday morning? Look at chapter 5, verse number 11. Brother Bob preached about this verse. It says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, Brother Bob did a great illustration on that word atonement. There's a lot of wrong ideas about that word atonement. I realize that. But it is a word that is used in combination with, of our justification and our reconciliation. And as Brother Bob so eloquently broke the word down in three pieces of paper and three people, it means at one men or at one with God. And so we are made at one with God. God himself paid the price of atonement. And the price of atonement being fully paid, he is just in justifying the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Man's guilt is first forgiven, then God can righteously justify. Listen, God can never justify a man in his ungodly state. He has to believe in Jesus Christ before he can be justified. Amen. Now, here's a fifth thing. Will a man be justified by his good works? No. We definitely know the answer to that is no. Look at chapter 3, verse number 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. Even if you could keep the law, and you can't, by the way, you would still not be justified in the sight of God. Now, look, well, I'm not going to turn there. I'll read the verse to you. If a man does as well as he can, and let me just ask you this. What man do you know, or woman, boy, girl, including yourself, that does the best that he can? We do once in a while. Sometimes we do the best we can. Most of the time, we do what we can get by with. So if a man could do the best that he can, and rarely he does, he will not be justified in the eyes of God. Now, he'll be justified in the eyes of man. That's not a bad thing. We ought to do all that we can to justify ourselves in the eyes of man, but he will not be justified in the eyes of God. James chapter 3, verse number 21, or James chapter 2, verse 21 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Yes, he was justified in the eyes of men, but he was not justified in the eyes of God. It was his faith that was counted for righteousness, not his works. The Bible tells us that in Romans 4, 2. says, If Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory in the sight of men, but not before God. I added that in the sight of men. Because it says he hath word of the glory, but not before God. He hath word of the glory before men, but he don't have nothing to glory about in the eyes of God. He's justified by faith. So there can be no works in God's sight unless they come from a good heart. And the fact that you're trusting in your good works and not in the good grace of God is truth that you don't have a good heart. Amen. So your heart is still an enemy with God. Now, here's number six. In what way does God justify a man? He justifies him judiciously. As by his own righteous act as a judge, the moment he believes in Jesus as his atoning substitute. There are three words that occur ten times in the fourth chapter of Romans that clearly express the nature and manner of this justification. These words are counted, reckoned, and imputed. Those three words appear ten times in Romans chapter number four. 
Thus we see that the righteousness of God is counted, reckoned, and imputed to the believer. It's the same sense as our sins were laid on the Lord Jesus Christ or imputed to Christ. So the righteousness of God is imputed upon all that believe. That's what the Bible says in verse 22 of Romans chapter 3. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So that is the righteous by faith of Jesus Christ. And then, now, here I go being critical again. What about the feelings then? Well, they're excluded. Now, I know I hear the song, you've heard the song, and I've, I've heard the people shout and rejoice and run all over the building when they sing the, the song, Oh, How It Feels or whatever. I can't even remember it now. I get so aggravated. Listen, I, I want to tell you something. I, I am thankful that there are times I can feel my salvation. I am thankful for the times that God has overflowed his goodness in my heart. And I, I can feel, I have the emotional feelings of God's redemption and God's presence in my life. I glory in that. I rejoice in that. But I'll tell you what. I'm still thankful that on the Monday mornings, when I get up discouraged and defeated and beaten down and, and upset and angry and all the same feelings and all the same emotions that you have, I'm glad that my salvation and my justification is still just as real when I can't feel it as it is when I can feel it. It's not about feelings. I'm thankful that sometimes we can feel it. It's about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So where is feeling then? It's, in, it's excluded. Salvation is not by feelings. I, listen, I've seen people come showing all kinds of emotion. I've seen people come, they, they were broken, they were weeping, they were sobbing, and you're excited that they have come, you're excited that they're broken, you're excited that, that they're emotional. I look around the building today, I don't see any of those people. I've seen people who have shown absolutely no emotion, they, they hear what you say, I believe that. And... and it's, so it, it's, it's, it's about what, where are you placing your faith? What is the object of your faith? The Lord Jesus Christ. So look, I'm, I'm done. Here's, here's my final thing. So all that being said, can a man be justified by simply believing? Yes. Completely. At once. And forever. What a blessing. In fact, he can be justified no other way. The Bible says in Romans 3, 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Verse number 28 says, if you go on, it says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. We've already read the verse several times. The Bible says in Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, Faith, we have peace with God. The Bible says in Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Amen. So the believing is ours and the counting is God's. God does, the, God does not reckon, count, or impute this justification in an unbeliever. In fact, the Bible says he that believeth not is condemned already. So God help you to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the Bible says today is the accepted time. Today is, now is the accepted time. And to, now is the day, behold, now is the day of salvation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 2. None of us have a promise.